Welcome again in the Gospel of Mark. We've now reached Mark chapter 3, and uh, as we mentioned in closing of chapter 2, Jesus was constantly challenged on the keeping of the Sabbath day. The uh, scribes and Pharisees tried to obey the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. And one of the things that Jesus was ever seeking to do was to say this, look, that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, God has created us on a seven-day cycle and we need to rest on that seventh day, which for us is which for us is the first day of the week, Sunday. The uh, French revolutionists were trying to destroy Christianity and uh, they decided to go on a tenth day cycle. They uh, ordained this. Robespierre, the leader of the uh, French Revolution, ordained it. And uh, the result was that the people had to work, you know, for nine days, and then the tenth they were allowed to rest. But you know, neither man nor animal was able to do that. We have been created by God for a seven-day cycle. And it all comes from the book of Genesis, the creation. You know, he created... For six days, and the sixth day was the creation of man. And then on the seventh, God rested and ordained a rest for each one of us on the seventh day. And uh, when we come into the Word of God, we find that that day is to be devoted to the Lord, to worshipping the Lord. Indeed, it is to... uh, shall I say, go to church and hear the word of God preached so that we will be fortified for the rest of the week. Well, we come to chapter 3 and uh, having had this difficulty and battle in chapter 2 over the Sabbath day where the Lord says, look, that Sabbath day was made for man not man for the Sabbath day. And therefore, the Lord is the Lord of the Sabbath day. And uh, let's be reasonable about these things. Well, he entered into the synagogue, of course, on the seventh day. And there was a man with a withered hand. And uh, the scribes and Pharisees were not interested in the healing for this man but they watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him oh what a terrible thing you know the Lord says well is it right to do good on the Sabbath day and obviously it is I mean we are to do good on a Sunday I mean if we see somebody you know, uh, fallen down on the Sabbath day, we have to rush and pick them up and help them and bring them to the hospital or whatever. Obviously, on the Sabbath day, we to do that which is right and help people. It's not a day that we seclude ourselves from those things. Well... He said to the man that had the withered hand, stand forth. And uh, he asked them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they held their peace. In other words, he said, look, what is lawful on the Sabbath day? It's obviously to do good on the Sabbath day. You help people on the Sabbath day as you would other days. Well, and uh, he was angry with them. 
the hardness of their heart. And he said to the man you know, with the withered hand, look, let's just stretch forth your hand. And it was healed. And the Pharisees were so angry that he had healed on the seventh day that they go and collaborate with the Herodians who were the party of Herod and who were secular and they were seeking to kill Jesus. Well, Jesus knowing this has now to withdraw himself. One of the things that's been made very clear in the Gospels that there's a chronological timing for the martyrdom of Jesus, that he must die on a certain time, a certain date. He must die in Jerusalem. He must die on the Passover day because he is a Passover lamb. And so he must not die before the time. So here he withdraws himself. And uh, there we find that he's back in Galilee and those in Judea follow him. And from Jerusalem, Idumea in the south, beyond Jordan, Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, great multitude, all the people around are following him. And uh, there were so many that he said, look, and he came to the Sea of Galilee, he said, but let's have a small boat and let's get in it and uh, then I can speak from this boat. And he healed many and unclean spirits when they saw him fell down before him and cried saying, thou art the Son of God. You know, that's one of the things that... Uh, we have to understand that Satan and his angels and demons, you know, they rebelled against God. They were cast out and uh, they knew that Jesus had come to save us. They knew that in going to the cross, they would lose all their power and Every demon, every fallen angel knew who Jesus was, that he was the Son of God. And uh, others, of course, you see, the mankind did not know that, but they did. And so they cried out with a loud cry, you know, aren't you come to torment us before the time? And that's a, a very interesting thing. You know that um, James brings it out that Satan and all his hordes, they know that they have been defeated on the cross. They know that there is a given time and they themselves will be tormented. And James brings out this thought. He said, you know, the demons believe and tremble. They believe and tremble. They know who Jesus is. And therefore, at the name of Jesus, they tremble and they recede. And so you want to use the name of Jesus often. And in so doing, you'll find that the demonic powers, perhaps who are afflicting you, will fall back. Well, he healed many and... Uh, the unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him, cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the Son of God. They fell down before him. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Oh, they know who Jesus is. And they know that on the cross, they were defeated by him. And they know that at the given moment they shall indeed lose all their power and they indeed shall be in the lake of fire well and he straightly charged them that they should not make him known 
they should not make him known. And uh, he went up to a mountain. And now we're coming back to a very important truth that we mentioned before, that Jesus, in order to fulfill his ministry, in order to be the light to the Gentiles, in order to be the saviour of the world and to bring that message to every generation, the thing that Jesus had to do was to raise up uh, an inheritance of spiritual seed. And uh, we're now going to see that he chooses 12 disciples. And uh, the point that I want to bring out here, which is very important from the uh, aspect of each one of our lives, and that is this, that we should train young men, young women, perhaps older ones too, in the ways of God, that they will propagate the message that God has given to us. Because, you know, from the time of, shall I say, Abraham, it was very clear indeed that God said to Abraham, in thy seed should all the nations of the world be blessed. Well, Abraham obviously would not visit all these nations But it was his seed that would do it. And, uh, you know, there's a very uh, lovely little illustration in the uh, New Testament concerning a spiritual seed. And that is Paul with Timothy. Timothy is spoken of by Paul as being his son in the Lord. And uh, he confided and he embested in Timothy and also in Titus and others, you know, the truths that God had given him so that they in turn would reproduce them to others. And so, you know, as a pastor, as a teacher, as a minister, you know, ask God to give you your Timothys so that you can invest in them and so that when your time comes to go to heaven, the truths that God has given you will be reproduced and reproduced and reproduced through your Timothys. Well, Jesus, of course, is ordaining twelve. And uh, <clears throat> and what is the purpose? Well, in verse 14, it says, And he ordained twelve, that they should be with him. You see, they should be with him, first of all, and that he might send them forth to preach. So, first of all, they should be with him. You see, unless your disciples are with you, you cannot impart truth to them. So, you must allow them to come near to you. You must allow them to be with you. And uh, Paul would say, the things that you've seen in me, you know, do to others. And first things first, that they should be with him. So the twelve were with Jesus throughout his ministerial life. And they observed everything he did. And then, what was the purpose? That he might send them forth to preach send them forth to preach. See? And then, in verse 15, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. You know, uh, the church in France, uh, the Pentecostal church in France, was raised up by a certain uh, godly minister uh, called Douglas Scott from England. And he would gather the young... uh, French men around him and he would seek to elevate them so that when he raised up a church he would have one of these young men become the pastor and so they said well what should we do and this is what he said he said uh, I'm going to use French to start with faites comme moi faites comme moi 
uh, in other words, do as I do. And what did he do? Well, he preached, and then he laid hands on the sick, and the sick were healed. And the result is the young men did the same thing, and that's how the churches got established in France, you see. Fait comme moi, do as I do, see. Well, there we are, you see. But I would commend that uh, in verse 14, you study that, he ordained 12 that they should be with him, and he might send them forth to preach and to have power over sicknesses to heal. And uh, then we have uh, the uh, various names of the eleven. And then the twelfth one, verse 19, Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him. And they went into a house. Now, here is something that's also important. You know, Jesus knew exactly whom he had chosen. And he had to choose one who would betray him. And he knew all the time who would betray him, Judas of Iscariot. But people say, well, poor Judas. Oh, no. Look, Judas had exactly the same opportunities as all the rest. He was with Jesus. He observed Jesus. He heard the preachings and teachings of Jesus. He indeed saw the miracles that emanated from the body of Jesus when he prayed for the sick or they touched him. And also, you see, another important factor, that God gave Judas exactly the same power that he gave to the others. But we're told in Psalm 109, the Psalm of Judas Iscariot, that he did not love blessing but love cursing. And here is something I'd like to uh, mention just for a moment. You know, there is in the Word of God a little illustration. And uh, in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, we are called teachers of righteousness. Teachers of righteousness. And that is what He wanted uh, the twelve to be teachers of righteousness. But in Isaiah 61, it mentions trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Now then, I want to put this before you. It's something that's very important that you should teach your Timothys, teach your disciples. And that is this. Look, you are to teach and preach and pray for the sick do what I do but you know there's something more important than that that you yourself should be a tree of righteousness so that from a life of righteousness flows teaching of righteousness you see I have met in my time many excellent teachers but they have not had if I could say this the character that sustains their teaching they have not been teachers of righteousness so I would commend to you that you teach your Timothys your Tituses you teach them that they become trees of righteousness the planting of the Lord And from that godly character emanates teaching. The two must go together. Now, we come back to the life of Jesus and uh, the crowds are there and uh, scribes come down from Jerusalem and then they accuse him of being bees above the prince of devils and he said well how can Satan cast out Satan and if a house be divided against itself that house cannot stand and uh, the thought is this you know a divided house cannot stand 
And he's referring to Satan. He said, well, if Satan casts out Satan, you know, obviously, you know, he cannot stand. But I want to turn it into the church. You know, the church has to be united. It has to be united that it stands. And one of the things that, you know, a pastor has to seek, and that is to unite his people, that they are all of one mind. There are four unities, you know. A united heart in Psalm 68, verse 11. In Ephesians 4, 3, unity of the Spirit. 4, 11, unity of the faith. And then in Psalm 133, the unity of the brethren. You know, a united church stands against all the powers of the enemy and brings those powers down. Well, and then he brings out the thought in verse 27, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his goods, spoil his house. In other words, we must indeed fight against Satan and overcome him so that we control him and not him, us. Now then, it's on forgiveness of sins. And he said, all sins will be forgiven you, except that which is against the Holy Spirit. And uh, he said, that shall never be forgiven, the unforgivable sin. And what is the unforgivable sin? The unforgivable sin is knowing with knowledge that a manifestation comes from the Holy Spirit, comes from God, and yet we attribute it to Satan. Have I had an experience? Yes, I had a, an experience, several actually, but one in particular. You know, here was a minister, and in fact he was the principal of the Bible school, one of the Bible schools that I attended. And uh, he was talking to me about speaking in other tongues, the Holy Spirit, baptism. And uh, he said, uh, you know, I, I don't want you preaching that in my school. I said, well, and I felt the presence of God. I said to him, is it of God or is it of Satan? And he was caught. Because if he said it, it is of God, then how can you object to preaching it? If he said it was of Satan, and he knew full well that it was not, he would commit the unforgivable sin. And then he looked at me, and he said, it's of Satan. And I said, well, and he said, yes. And so we parted company. But that is the unforgivable sin. Well, we want to come to the last part now of Mark chapter 3. And uh, it's relative to the brethren and mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the crowd said, look, your mother and your brethren are calling out. They want you. And... Uh, Jesus' response is very interesting. And this is what he said who, in, in verse 33. Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked around about him, which sat about him and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother, my sister, and mother my brother, my sister, and mother. It is those that do the will of God. And there is a difference between our natural families and our spiritual families. You know, so often we have more fellowship with our spiritual families than we do with our natural families. Because our natural family 
does not necessarily do the will of God. And therefore, we do not have that fellowship. I mean, I have a very wonderful, you know, a natural family in England, but they don't all do the will of God. And there is, shall I say, not that fellowship that I enjoy with those of our church, because those of our church are intent on doing the will of God. I also want to mention this, and uh, it was a, a situation that uh, occurred in Canada all the last century, about a hundred years ago, if not a little more. And uh, it involved a Catholic priest who was very well known, very much loved, and uh, quite a good preacher, actually. And uh, he uh, was saying to the people, well, you know, if you have a problem, come to Mary, because uh, she will uh, speak to her son and uh, on your behalf. And all oh, the people wept and so forth. And as he was driving away from this meeting late at night, uh, on a snow, a snow plow actually, the Lord said, you're a liar. On earth... Jesus didn't listen to his mother. How would she now have any authority over him? So let us go to Jesus and not to Mary. Amen? Well, God bless you.